Today we'll be discussing how we, a librarian and an instructional technologist, developed the first Intro to Digital Humanities class at UNBC, the University of Northern British Columbia. Also, if you're a fan of Bon Appetit Test Kitchen videos, that's the aesthetic theme of our presentation, so enjoy. So, what is DH? Uh, because we are here at Access, I will save you a long-winded definition of digital humanities. So if you're hoping for a lively and esoteric debate about DH, you are out of luck today. Uh, what we will do is discuss how the digital humanities is often conceived in very specific ways and how that can impact the engagement of librarians in DH or DH adjacent work. So little institutional fish, big DH pond. So often we conceive of the digital humanities as this monolithic field, sort of big D, big H. Um, it's a relatively buzzy field that's been around for over a decade, and for those encountering it for the first time, the literature really makes it seem that you need to engage with DH work in a specific way. So being that your institution needs to have a DH center, an institute, faculty specialists, a great deal of funding, and often an academic program. So to those new to librarianship and or academia working within DH can appear unreachable, especially to those of us who aren't located at a major research institution with this kind of infrastructure. A little bit about our institution. Um, so we have none of these things. Uh, we're very small. We're about 3,500 students. And humanities programs are definitely not at the forefront of our offerings. So ultimately, none of these aspects here are associated with DH scholarship at our institution. But as a librarian overseeing both systems and web, um, so tech-related stuff at UMBC, um, and an instructional technologist, we both have dipped our toes in DH-adjacent work and felt that an introductory course could be beneficial to our institution despite not having this infrastructure. We saw the value of exposing students to new tech tools and skills that they can bring forward even if they don't explicitly pursue DH work, uh, and open up the idea of DH methods to students early in their academic career. So we started looking for opportunities where we might be able to you know, uh, onboard this course, uh, the institution. We found one that was called computing in, uh, computing in the Humanities, but the course description hadn't been updated in ages. So we identified that as our opportunity to, to do a little bit of uh, creative uh, um, revision of the syllabus. Uh, I approached our chair, the chair was enthusiastic about it. And with my great fortune to meet uh, Annalise who has a background in digital humanities. So we started to line up a few of these opportunities to create some, um, to create some momentum. But like um, uh, Annalise said, we didn't, we don't have any scholars, any digital humanities scholars that are institutions. So I have to think creatively of how we're going to bring all these different pieces and components to bear. So one thing when we started talking about this in 2008, we wanted to do a, uh, uh, in this case, it had to be an online course, a, um, uh, but there were quite a few students that were actually based on the campus as well, so they could come to the campus, some could not. Uh, we wanted this to be a uh, very participatory, project-based uh, course, uh, and we, uh, one thing that I really wanted to bring to this, I wanted students to have some uh, experience managing their own domain, which scared many students. The whole idea that they would have to, you know, get into cPanel and start working with things, and a lot of these students had no experience whatsoever with that, with that aspect of technology. Um, uh, and we all, of course, we wanted to uh, tap into the, some of the latest scholarship and thinking around digital humanities, but in a way that we could do it in, in, uh, with uh, undergraduate students, it would be introductory. So we, we gathered a bunch of different tools together. Uh, we, did use, we did encourage students to use a, um, a, a host called Reclaim Hosting. They do have a lot of great um, uh, uh, services to help uh, pr um, uh, students with managing their digital identity, web literacies. 
uh, we secured a discount code for students, so the cost of a, their, own per, their own domain along with um, their one year of hosting was $20 Canadian. There was no textbook, so that was the total cost of the students for, to uh, get access to that uh, domain. Um, we, inside uh, that uh, package, we, uh, we had to use this little helper application called Installatron, which is basically kind of like a one-click application for uh, LAMP applications. So you could click, put in a subdomain, and it would guide you through kind of like a wizard in and then set up some of these uh, um, applications that were common in the digital humanities. So one thing we required them to do is have a content management system, with, and we required them to use WordPress. Coach, uh, coach them through that. We encourage students to install and, and, uh, and create and destroy at subdomains using a number of different applications to get a feel for uh, how some of that uh, uh, workflow uh, works. With regards to engagement with the reading, we use an uh, online uh, a web annotation tool called Hypothesis. The first year we did it, um, we uh, had a private group the second time we did it just recently, we had them annotate uh, publicly, which allowed us to take advantage of some other applications that are in the wild. Like one, if you've never used, um, if you've ever used Hypothesis before, there's a really good application called Crowd Layers out of the University of uh, uh, Colorado, which kind of provides a dashboard of all the um, annotations and in, 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 uh, uh, um, web resources. Uh, for communication, we did not use a learning management system. We used something called Mattermost. So I've heard the word Slack a few times already in the room. I think it's sort of like Slack with all different types of integrations, but it's open source and we could self-host. We didn't actually host this at our institution. We, uh, we participate in, a, in an open technology co-op in the uh, province of British Columbia, so we took advantage of their Mattermost offering. And uh, uh, there's, again, lots of uh, tools that are uh, openly available to students on the web, are very familiar to all of you here, Voyant, uh, Timeline, JS, the good stuff out of the Night Lab. So uh, just being judicious on how uh, we reach out and gather these tools together, we could actually you know, put together a fairly robust uh, collection of tools for students to, um, to get started with. So, um, despite, uh, you know, a lot of work that went into our first iteration, uh, we saw a number of opportunities to improve the class in 2019. So, contrary to popular belief, students are not technology wizards. Um, we encountered a great deal of tech anxiety in this class, and students often weren't asking for help when they needed it because they were too anxious. Um, Evaluations noted that students felt that there wasn't enough communication, so being an asynchronous online course, that of course is a struggle, but we're like, how can we fix that? Um, also, there was a, you know, some mild confusion about why a librarian was co-teaching, because librarians just deal with books, right? What can I uh, help with? What can I answer questions about? Also, sort of at its core, we saw that the group of students in the class was really diverse. So this wasn't necessarily just folks who were in the English and history, like humanities programs. They were in a wide range of disciplines. Um, so a lot of students even struggled with the idea of the humanities and what a humanities project looks like, let alone a digital humanities project. So uh, English 201, 2019 edition. Uh, we made several changes based on the student feedback and self-evaluation. So first, we created more structured communication with online and on-campus office hours and appointments and check-ins. So we caught more students who were struggling earlier and they were able to catch up in ways that they hadn't been able to in the first iteration. Um, in terms of myself, I made sure to explicitly list what I can help with and my background, so I had students directly coming to me to ask those questions, whereas before they did not. Uh, we also had prescribed parameters for assignments, so we shifted from suggested exercises in 2018 to required exercises. Um, this still allowed for student choice, but the intention here was to help scaffold student learning rather than limit student agency. And for our readings, 
um, we added more critical voices in our readings, so more women, more people of color, and a more critical approach. And we really saw that students engaged much more deeply. So again, adding uh, algorithms of oppression in there, uh, students really engaged well with that. So we saw not only more engagement, but also the projects themselves improved and showed more complexity. So moving forward. Um, in terms of moving forward with the next iteration of the class, there are a number of changes that we'd like to make. Uh, so we got a lot of feedback from students who wished the course was longer, so in the fall or winter semester, and in the classroom. And we too think that students would benefit from a more comprehensive class with a lab component. To support those tech skills at a point of need, we can make ourselves as available as possible online, but it isn't quite the same as being in a lab. So what we're doing right now is we're advocating to have the class added to a future fall winter semester and expanding the course. Um, and despite redesigning the class completely, the calendar course description, due to the bureaucracy of universities, uh, was still unchanged. So right now we're moving through the process of updating this to better reflect the actual class and draw in more students. Um, but before, there was mention of word processing and the World Wide Web. So something we're looking to change. Um, accessibility. So while that was definitely a consideration in 2018 and 19, it's something that is never done and is never, uh, can never not be improved. So we got some really great feedback from some students um, who requested better captioning for our class videos, even though they had the standard YouTube captioning, um, and gave us some ideas for other ways that we can make the class more accessible for our students. And we're also bringing DH to other classrooms on campus. So right now, I'm doing a series of mini lectures in the social geography program, um, introducing mapping software um, to kind of like dip uh, folks' toes into DH. So uh, some takeaways. Um, while being at a small institution entails often far fewer resources and funding, it can also mean more freedom and the ability to take risks that I don't necessarily always see at bigger institutions. Whether or not you consider yourself a DH person, um, you likely have some transferable skills by de facto being in this room right now. Um, so that could potentially add some value to the classrooms at your institution, whether it's a full DH class like we embarked upon, or even like a short tutorial for a specific software. Um, it's really important to note that we wouldn't have been able to do this without the wealth of openly available and accessible tools and resources, specifically the scholarship of folks like Johanna Drucker and DH 101, um, Miriam Posner and Gentry Sayers, among others. Um, that work really helped us shape our course. In sum, we saw firsthand the value of opening up the world of DH to our students at an institution, institution where they wouldn't be able to otherwise. Um, at the end, we heard about ideas for future projects, websites they want to build, and ultimately, for students who don't usually get to build tangible things, they were able to build something that they would be able to show people and be proud of, and that was really empowering for folks. So thank you. And we also have a link to our course website here if you want to check it out as well. Thanks. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Um, do we have any questions? Um, OK, while you're all thinking about it, I'll ask one of mine, which is you mentioned sort of tech and anxieties in some of your students. And I was just wondering if you could speak a little bit more about how you address some of those or help those students get over some of that anxiety. Um, 
I mentioned that we use the, this uh, team collaboration software, Mattermost. I really encourage students to ask the questions there. And then, because often there was a little bit of peer mentoring that went on there. People could sort of allay each other's fears or clarify the question someone had. It was really great that, I mean, I, this was a, a course being taught online. It was great that Annalise had office hours and students could come and see Annalise. And then there were a number of students that would know, become stuck. And it, they were stuck most because of that sort of you know nervousness and once I have that first face-to-face -face interaction a little bit more courage to push and try the next piece so that that, that those two certainly helped um, and to add to that as well um, as a librarian I'm like a lot of you in that I have a bachelor's in English and psychology so I could use that personal aspect to really relate to folks and how I felt when I first started to encounter technical things in library school. Um, and that I am not sort of this like lofty figure, this expert, I am still learning things every day and by no means an expert. So that really helped too, that sort of personal relationship. Uh, so I apologize if, if you mentioned this and I, and I missed it, but um, I think it was really crafty to, uh, to take an existing course and sort of inhabit it from the inside and change its, its content, although I see the challenge you have now to change it officially. But the, the question I have is, does that mean that it already counts um, in certain programs as, a, as an elective that students can take towards degree progress? Yes. Um, it already it, it counts okay. as an elective. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So you mentioned that some of the students um, were not even familiar with the humanities necessarily, not just the digital aspect that was a challenge. Can you speak a little bit more about your student population um, and what, uh, which students ended up taking this class? Each offering, it was, it was quite different. I mean, we, we it would span everything from, we had a computer science student who really took well to the technologies and in sort of the architecture of how things were put together. But when asking be able to take, let's say, uh, um, a, a star map, you know, an astrology, you know, star map, and then put that beside some other kind of uh, project, he wouldn't be able to pick which one would qualify as humanities project. He, he had evaluated it based on it, the technology and the process, not necessarily the, the inherent content. Um, so uh, the student body and, uh, is uh, um, diverse. Our, our, I guess our largest populations are nursing and, and uh, social work and, and, and then, programs. yeah, professional programs and then it sort of moves out from there. Um, but I, both times the, the dynamics of the class were so different and I don't think we actually did a actually, you know, split apart um, what the populations were, do you recall? Not explicitly, um, but I, if I can recall, those actually in humanities as a program were in the minority in the class. So uh, health sciences, yeah, computer science, um, a wide range, yeah. Um, can you also mention, I don't know if you covered this or not, but the size of the classes and how you feel about scale for an online class like this? What, what works, what's challenging? Luckily, we'd, our scale was fairly small, because I don't know if you got it, certainly with an online course, if you got into, you know, just Annalise and I, if you've got into 40 students, I don't think this would work out very well, 30, 40. Now, I know that we're coming from a small institution. 40 students for me seems like a lot of students, right? <laughs> like, so, but I, we, I think we had, first time, like a, half, a dozen? Yeah. And the second time, about a little less than that, and that seemed very manageable. And it was it was large enough that there was opportunities for peer mentoring, but not so large that we we couldn't actually, you know, do um, uh, you know I guess the assessment was was quick. I mean, we could be quick with some of our you know formative feedback. Um, just uh, because students go from your class to other classes, is there any like kind of uptake in instructors and faculty that like kind of have the, these students coming along with these skills? Hmm. Did you encounter any? Mm. 
it's still early days. It was first offered last year. Um, but um, word is spreading a little bit, and that's sort of like how I got into the social geography department is through my work with this class. Um, and so, yes, it's still germinating yeah. very much so. Um, and so I think what we're trying to do now, or that I'm trying to do now, is kind of find those people that sort of like ourselves, like have adjacent interests and adjacent research and could benefit from understanding that this world exists. I, I would say certainly, like when when we uh, drafted the course outline, we used the term embedded librarian the first time around and the second time. And I know that that was a term that I might might have heard occasionally in conversations with my colleagues. But now I hear that term more. Like there's more, more awareness. We have a long way to go, but I think there's more awareness through the types of things that we've done in this course of what that can look like. You know. All right, well, thank you very much. Of course. <laughs>